Thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We're finally back in person um, for the Vermont uh, Organics Recycling Summit. Our theme this year is Compost Nature's Climate Champion. Um, a little housekeeping to begin with. Uh, first, I'm Natasha Duarte. I know almost everybody here and probably most of the people in the Zoom room as well. Um, but I'm the director of the Composting Association of Vermont. I'm thrilled to be here again. Um, for people in the Zoom room, um, we are going to be managing questions by chat in the chat box. Feel free to put questions anytime in there. And Shannon is going to be your voice today during the session. And so um, we will be, she'll be monitoring them and asking questions for you um, virtually. And also, if you can stay muted throughout, that would be great because this is being recorded. Um, for people in person, a couple basics. There are restrooms, both upstairs and downstairs, all the way at the back here. Men's, I believe, are on the right. Women's on the left. There are also um, water fountains with water bottle fillers. Um, if you did not bring your own water bottle, there are cups here. Um, so help yourself if you need that. We didn't bring water here in the room. There's coffee and food. Um, Orca Media is here. If you were assuming this is an open um, uh, meeting, but if someone really does not want to be on camera, or there's also going to be photographs taken throughout the day, please come and see me and let me know, um, just so we can respect your preferences there. Um, let's see. I also want to just quickly call attention to the fact that this is the kickoff week for international, or this is a kickoff event for International Compost Awareness Week, which starts this coming Sunday. And Dr. Deb Nair, who is here, her compost ecology class um, does these great International Compost Awareness Week posters every year. And so for folks in the Zoom room, you can go to composting Vermont forward slash VORS, V O R S. And there's a whole gallery of all the photos, along with an explanation for the students' inspiration for creating them. And then for those of you in the room, they are up around the room. So as you have time or want to wander around during lunch or break time, um, you can take some time to check those out. So that's a really neat collaboration that the Composting Association of Vermont has had with Deb and her UVM class. So thank you for that. Um, I would like to also um, just let folks know that there are a lot of folks from the Agency of Natural Resources in the room, if you want to just wave. Um, folks on Zoom can't see that, but for folks here, they also have a table just outside um, as you go out to the left. Feel free to stop in and say hello, check out the materials they have available. And then we also have a number of uh, my board of directors for the Composting Association of Vermont in the room. And if you all can raise your hands and wave. And there is a CAV table just outside. And so feel free to introduce yourselves if you don't know us um, or if you have any questions, uh, track us down. And with that, um, let's see, I am going to pass it over. Well, here, let me just, I think I have, oops, sorry. Um, I'd like to give a huge thank to all of our sponsors. I can't believe I almost forgot to say that, but thank you to everybody who um, has made this possible. We have eight of you downstairs exhibiting. Um, there are links on the website to check out their, um, their information in more detail for folks online. And um, Eco Products and Prohibition Pig are sponsoring an after event at Prohibition Pig Brewery. So, if any of you in the room are participating in that, you should have drink tickets in the good for beer, wine, and non alcoholic beverages um, in the back of your name tag. If you are on the fence about going, we have some extra tickets, so come see me. We have space if you'd like to come along. Um, you're very welcome. And, um, and then just a quick look at today's program. The block part in red is what is being held as hybrid. And then um, we'll move into lunch. And then we have great, three great concurrent sessions. Um, and then we'll be coming back for an afternoon plenary. All right. And now, with that, Dan, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite Dan Goosen, president of the CAV Board of Directors, to come and give a welcome. 
You don't have the slides, right? I'm just going to. Uh, oops, well, I can't. Apparently, I can't move that. Uh, all right, well, do you want me to leave up the other slides that are up? Good. Okay, great. Take it away. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you all for being here. It is very exciting to have everybody in person, as Natasha already said. But we've been doing this for a long time. This is the 18th annual, and uh, we've, it's probably four years since we've done it in person like this. And so we're really, really happy to be back. Uh, we used to do it in Randolph. This is a new space for us so far. We're liking it pretty well. It's beautiful, uh, centrally located. Hopefully, I know some of you drove up from Southern Vermont and beyond. Um, so thank you all for making the effort for being here. And thank you all for those uh, joining online. Uh, we've got a good crowd out in the netherworld uh, who are listening in. So we're gonna do our best to make sure that we can talk to all of you and talk to all of them and include everybody when you have questions um, as they come up later in the day. Um, and then of course, uh, hopefully you've all gotten lots of emails about it, but if not, on the back of the schedules that um, are somebody picked up on your way in, if not, they're right on the first table, uh, it's got the full menu of all the workshops. So make sure that you are aware of what those are. There's some really good things for the rest of the week, Tuesday through Friday, um, and you can do them from the comfort of your home or your office or even listen in while you're driving if you do it safely. Uh, so, um, check those out. Um, it's great to see everybody's faces because composting, composters are great folks and having people, having the face-to-face -face connection is something that I've missed, um, but, have, but have really enjoyed when I've gone to national conferences in the past few years. So to be able to get everybody back in the same room and do the face-to-face -face is really important, I think. So thanks for making it possible because we couldn't do it if people didn't sign up. Um, we've got a full day ahead and great uh, exhibitors downstairs. Do check them out. Thank you again for all of the uh, sponsors and exhibitors without whom we couldn't do it. Um, also a &R, who puts this on. This is a &R's gig officially. We just happen to be the CAV, Composting Association of Vermont, is the one that are the ones who typically put it on. Uh, but big thanks to a &R, the CAV board, lots of members here. And some who are not here, uh, volunteers and the crew at the Sally Fox Conference Center for letting us use this space and A&R for arranging that. It's been a huge help. Um, and last but not least, I want to thank Natasha because she is a, an amazing executive director and has been for quite a few years and really is the charge that leads the way um, on all the projects that CAB does and undertakes. It's a huge amount of work. Um, VORS is a big piece of it, but we do a lot of programmatic work. And if you get a chance to chat with any of the board members, we'd love to tell you about some of the other things that go on throughout the rest of the year. Uh, but Natasha really is the person who makes it all happen. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And climate, this is, um, this is important for all of us, hopefully, the, the climate connection being this year's theme. Um, it's kind of always been a part of what, what we think about those of us who do composting. Um, I run Green Mountain Compost, I forgot to mention that, but we, you know, it's, we really love the work that we do, I think, in general, we can feel good, good about it, but I think uh, it's only in the last number of years that it's getting more mainstream in terms of people's making that connection between global warming and the climate and what composting is. So. We're excited that today's program has a lot of overlap, and we're going to be starting that with Jane Lazarczak, um, who began her career in public service with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Um, throughout her 15 years with the department, Jane served in various roles, most recently as the Public Land Section Chief, where she conserved more than 10,000 acres of public land and oversaw public land management for the department. In early 2020, Jane stepped into a new role working as the director of the Global Warming Solutions Act, or GWSA. As the director, Jane works closely with the Climate Council to stand up Vermont's initial climate action plan in December of 21. The plan speaks to how the state will cut out our emissions while investing in our rural communities to adapt to climate change, build resilience, and enhance the sequestration of our working and natural lands. 
As Vermont now stands up a climate action office, Jane directly oversees the policies, programs, and tools needed to implement climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilience strategies. Uh, Jane has a Master of Science from the Ecological Planning Program at UVM. So without further ado, please welcome Jane. Okay. I'm just going to pull up your slides. Uh, it's not very often that you have your bio read out loud, so it's <laughs> <laughs> a little funny. My son was being to <laughs> joked by his twin brother this morning about having a crush on a girl, and I feel almost as red as he looked. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. And so for folks in the room and on, um, on Zoom, I'll just say that um, uh, for folks in the room, hold your questions until Jane is done. Um, for folks in Zoom, feel free to put your questions at any time in chat, and then when we pause after your presentation, we will um, we will have time for some questions. Thanks. I think. Oops. It's, I think it looks good. It's probably just is it? Oh, okay. Slide. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, it's really a privilege, and it sounds like this is your first time back together in person in a number of years, so I um, am happy to be here to welcome you all here and kick off the day. I have just a handful of slides to orient you to what the Climate Action Office is doing, uh, since we're only about 18 months old. Um, the role of that office um, in state government, and then actually speak to sort of the exciting work that we have in thinking about waste management within the Climate Action Office and hopefully tee that up for some conversational questions from all of you about your role and how you can engage with us going forward. So the, as I just alluded to, the Climate Action Office is only about 18 months old. Um, it was a direct recommendation in that climate action plan that, um, sorry, that Dan just spoke to um, in his uh, introduction. The Climate Action Plan, while Vermont has had um, sort of fits and starts with direct action and planning around climate. The Global Warming Solutions Act, which was passed in 2020, um, put in place um, a direct requirements of the Vermont Climate Council, which is an outside body, outside of government, in standing up a plan that obligates government to take action, um, as well as thinking about how we involve all Vermonters in those solutions moving forward. So that plan, which was adopted for the first time on December 1st of 2021 and is required to be updated every four years, thinks a lot about how we cut our emissions reductions, but also thinks about the role of adaptation, resilience, community engagement, understanding that what is required of us to address climate change is nothing short of a wholesale shift in the way that we live on the landscape. It's not one action here, one action by government, personal action, it really is bold and um, change that we cannot really imagine um, moving forward sometimes, I feel like. So the Climate Action Office was a direct um, um, recommendation in that plan, understanding that the that government has a huge responsibility in moving these um, actions forward, um, and thinking about how we would coordinate that work across government and track that work and speak to the progress we're making as well as how to communicate to engage with Vermonters. That office could have really sat anywhere. It's no one agency's responsibility in moving climate action forward, but the Agency of Natural Resources has specific responsibilities from that Global Warming Solutions Act, and you, as Vermonters, or anyone, can actually take action against the Agency of Natural Resources if we're not doing our job. And that is not only on things that you typically think about that fall to the Natural Resources Agency. That's around how we meet our emissions reductions from some of the largest sectors, like transportation, the way we heat our homes. Um, those things all fall with now within the responsibility of a &R to think strategically about how we work across government to move that forward. So the Climate Action Office um, sits within the Secretary's Office of a &R, and it speaks to how to move the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act forward, but is supported broadly by members um, of secretaries and commissioners across all those agencies that have a stake in climate action. So we meet regularly, and we think about how to coordinate and amplify that work across government, 
and then uh, fall back and think about the specific programs and gaps that our office can help support and move forward in service of both the plan, the law, and broader climate action. So specifically, our shop is about um, eight people. When we're all said and done, we're actually still moving forward with hiring uh, right now. Have interviews this afternoon <laughs> for some posi positions. Um, but that expertise is broad in nature. We have folks who are uh, leading our climate change mitigation, so specifically thinking about how we cut our emissions, um, thinking about resilience and adaptation both in our built environment and our natural environment. And then also thinking about um, engagement and tracking progress. We have really um, a deep um, appreciation that engagement, um, this is uh, now formally recognized in the environmental justice law in Vermont and beyond, is not intended to be one-offs where we come out with a plan, ask for what you think of it, and then move forward. We're really thinking about how we build relationships with Vermonters so that as we have policies or plans that come out, we're not going to you for the first time, but we're igniting relationships that exist and asking folks to bring and co-create solutions with us going forward. So we have a whole arm of our office focused on what that looks like um, and do that regularly through um, meeting people where they are, through uh, focus groups, through public meetings, and really are continually thinking about engagement. Um, so that's really about our uh, transparent and reliable information. So it's about credibility and science, but it's about long-term commitments to working with Vermonters on all of these ideas. So coming back to um, climate change and specifically in Vermont, I alluded to this at the beginning, our largest sectors are transportation and buildings and thermal, the way we heat our homes and the way we move around the landscape. But um, solid waste and non-energy emissions um, are also tracked within what's called our greenhouse gas inventory. So this is an inventory that we've been doing in Vermont. Um, not all states have specific state inventories. Some states rely on national uh, EPA inventories. But Vermont, as a leader in this space for a number of years, has been tracking our specific emissions um, since 2007. This is now the legal backstop to the law that was passed in 2020 and is what will hold us accountable to meeting our emissions reductions. So, this inventory is produced annually. It's produced about two and a half years past the calendar year because of um, holdups in some of the data that we get nationally. Um, but it shows you on the left side uh, what we've actually uh, um, inventoried and accounted and published. And then on the right side, it shows you in that grayed out area where we're required to go based on the law. So these were goals that Vermont had on the books for almost two decades, but we weren't making significant progress, um, and hence the law. So this is really where that statutory requirement now comes in, the first of which is actually at the end of this year. So we are required um, by January 1st of 2025 to cut our emissions 26% below 2005 levels. Conveniently, 2005 was actually our peak year for emissions, I'm not sure what was happening in 20 in 2005, but our emissions were the highest then. So cutting them, we're, we have reasonable confidence to think we're going to meet that emissions reductions target, but where we're not on track yet is, the, is 2030, where we're essentially in line with the Paris Climate Agreement to cut our emissions in half, which is about 40% below 1990 levels. So um, that will take significant policy action um, as well as action from all of us as Vermonters um, to meet that uh, requirement. And we're actually advancing an update to our climate action plan, which is due July 1st of 2025, really focused on that target right now. What are the policies? What are the regulations? What are the work that we need to do and programmatically to ensure that we're on track? The, Glo uh, the Affordable Heat Act last year which was around um, how we heat our homes and buildings, is poised to help us do it for buildings and thermal. Transportation is a really hard nut to crack, um, largely because we're a rural state, not a lot of people move in single occupancy vehicles. It's, it's hard to think about how we do that um, in an equitable way when electric vehicles are very expensive still. We think about how to cut those costs. 
But what I'd like to show for all of you and shift the conversation to is that we have relatively clean electricity, which is our, the blue sector. For almost every other state, electricity is either second or first in the most emissions they produce, but we've made great strides through our renewable energy standard, through a regional cap and invest that uh, looks at how we uh, reduce our emissions cooperatively with our neighbors for electricity. Um, and then agriculture is actually our third largest sector, um, but we think a lot about how to not only enhance agriculture um, for the benefits of resilience and adaptation, because we know that having that on the landscape is important, but we're also working collaboratively to think about how to enhance practices that farmers do to cut emissions. So finally, waste management is this teeny <laughs> little gray line at the bottom, but really important, right? Because the way our law is written is actually no one sector can carry the burden of cutting emissions for all the other sectors. Proportionally, we're thinking about solutions to cut our emissions across all these sectors. So really thinking equitably about the burden and opportunity for sectors to clean up. So I'm just gonna highlight two examples for our office um, that we're helping support, just to give you the power and benefit of what an office like this can do. The Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed um, just over a year ago in the summer of 2023, was really comprehensive climate legislation at the federal level. Um, and there were a lot of grants, a lot of t uh, tax incentives. Really, the power of that law is tax credits, actually. Um, but there were also pots of funding. You, you might have heard last week, Vermont was actually awarded $62 million for Solar for All, which was really an opportunity to help private landowners enhance solar on your properties. But we also had the opportunity to coordinate um, and think about a grant called the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, which was the biggest bucket of funding in that pot for states to think creatively about how to meet our emissions reductions where we are, meet us where we are, and what those gaps are. And so um, Vermont, uh, our office, coordinated across government to think about where are all these other pots of money coming in, where are their policies, where are their solutions, and where is there still need? And we worked really closely with the Solid Waste Division to think about what are some really exciting opportunities in waste management to move the needle to take advantage of the funding. So we actually did apply for $100 million on April 1st, 99.98 million, because if you moved over 100 million, you got kicked into a different bucket. So we tried to get as close without going over. Um, and while it doesn't focus on actions that have an adaptation and resilience benefit, um, we tried to think about where there were co-benefits for those um, opportunities, knowing that um, those, uh, those um, actions that have the most co-benefits are really the most competitive and really where we want to be putting our um, energy in Vermont. So that application, which we'll hear about on July 1st, focused on these four areas. Other states really took a very traditional approach to looking at transportation and buildings and heating, which are really those traditional measures of like, how do we pay for EVs? How do we pay for home weatherizations? We did that, but we also know that Vermont has a lot of money in that space right now through other grants. So we really wanted to um, take advantage again of the natural and working land sector where we have a lot of co-benefits and then other smaller sectors that often get forgotten about and don't get the funding that they really need because we know how important they are. And for solid waste, we really um, think about two things, which you all know way more than me, but really think about how to reduce the amount of waste um, produced. So how do we compost? How do we not consume as much? And then how do we reduce the emissions from that residual waste that we as a state create? So we thought a lot about actions and bringing funding for new programs and existing programs where we enhance school recycling and composting, safe disposal of equipments um, with harmful gases. A lot of the gases um, th um, produce greenhouse uh, potential. Um, and then think about how we reduce emissions at transportation, uh, trans transfer stations and solid waste management facilities. At the end um, of this presentation is the website for our office, and if anybody's interested in seeing more about what, how, what those actions look like, the plan's linked um, in a summary document, and you can see where the, the money will actually flow. 
And then finally, just to end on one exciting opportunity to broaden the space outside of cutting emissions is the governor and the treasurer's office announced the development of a resilience implementation strategy in January of this year. So thinking about um, the opportunity and challenges associated with climate disasters such as the flooding Vermont had last summer, how do we think about what government is already doing in that space to build resilience and adaptation and where are their gaps? So this doesn't necessarily um, <clears throat> relate to solid waste yet, but it does relate to our interests as Vermonters in creating solutions and opportunities in our communities that move us through disasters like that in a much um, better and um, equitable way that brings people along. So we um, are working closely and staffing the governor and the treasurer's office and thinking about what government is doing, where the gaps are, and then prioritizing those gaps and thinking about how we fund that work long term with the treasurer's office. And that's something that's happening concurrently with the next climate action plan so that we're not only focused on planning, but really thinking about what implementation looks like and the role of government in that space. Um, and I get really excited about this because um, we have a moral and statutorily responsible uh, responsibility in cutting our emissions, but Vermont will feel the impacts. We are feeling the impacts of climate change already. And in thinking about cost-effective solutions, thinking about resilience and adaptation is such a win-win for so many other things that we as Vermonters care about. So really excited about this work. Um, and again, there's a lot of opportunities to engage with our office. We had kickoff events last week with the treasurer um, and we'll be rolling out a whole strategy on how we meet folks where they are and would love to partner with folks on the ground uh, where you are uh, talking to Vermonters to talk about the work that we're doing in this space. So I will uh, wrap up there. I know that you have a great day ahead of you and I'm happy to answer any questions about the work of the Climate Action Office and happy to also follow up with you um, in, on any ideas um, and ways that you work with people too. Thank you. Thank you um, everybody and um, Thank you, Jane, so much. If there are any questions, Allie's gonna be walking around with a microphone and Shannon will be your voice. And um, apologies to folks in the Zoom room. Um, we did not have your slides being shown. Uh, that was my bad as we're doing our first hybrid uh, conference. So we'll get that fixed for the next time. I never plugged in my computer, so I'm gonna do that next. <laughs> and um, <laughs> while you guys are having questions, and then um, we'll also get Emma Stuhl's slides up for the next presentation, which is State of the State of Organics in Vermont. Uh, so thank you all, and um, any questions? Right in front of you, Emma. Um, hi, I'm uh, Jim Stiles, I'm from St. Albans. Uh, I was wondering, uh, with the new initiative that uh, was just discussed last week with uh, Mike Pichak and, uh, and the second pair, uh, um, uh, are there any opportunities to be involved in that prior to the state uh, completing its internal gap stuff? I know that there'll be public input after the fact, but uh, I'm the uh, chair of the uh, Climate and Energy Committee uh, in St. Albans, mm -hmm. and we've done some work that I think uh, has a lot of merit. Can can you know there there are really big opportunities, and we're pretty focused on that stuff. And I would love to have an opportunity to, you know, put some of that forward. Yeah, that's great. Um, we um, the the resilience implementation strategy um, has been very focused on like the role of government, understanding that. Government um, is only a large piece, but not the only way to think about how to build resilience and adaptation, especially coming off the floods last summer, most of the communities that were able to rebound or move projects forward are ones that have really amazing social fabrics, have energy and action networks, have community members engaged. So um, there are other opportunities that we're thinking about how to bring voices in collectively around that space, especially around thinking about have the specific response to the floods, um, as well as spending and financing all of these initiatives. And the treasurer is actually rolling out a private public interface um, dialogue and discourse. So there will be more opportunities 
um, moving forward, and um, I will look to share that with folks um, to make them public. So thanks for that question, Jim. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Um, I got to attend the New York State Summit, similar to Boers, a couple weeks ago, and one of the things I learned there is New York has a, um, I believe it's through an executive order, but a lead by example on sustainability and climate change. I didn't know if there was any comparable effort here in Vermont, because it seems like a good way to engage state agencies that normally aren't, don't have climate goals on, as top of mind. That's a great question, thanks. So, um, so we work very closely with New York and other states and those lead by example um, initiatives are championed through um, our role and membership in the US Climate Alliance. And so for folks who don't know, the US Climate Alliance was an alliance of governors who came together after um, Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement and many states stood up and said, well, we collectively are still going to move forward with these requirements of the Paris Climate Agreement. And Governor Scott was one of the founding uh, governors to sign on to that in 2017. Um, and that initiative um, often asks states to step up and make commitments to demonstrate and lead by example in just broadly in climate. And so lead by example for folks who don't know what that is saying is it's essentially saying that government will model much of the work that's needed to happen um, and hope that others will come along. Um, at the time, um, Governor Scott, we, we didn't have capacity nor interest to sign on to that collectively. That is not to say that we're not doing many of those things. Um, Building and General Services has tons of amazing programs and thinking about fleet management, um, electrification of uh, state buildings. It's just the, that sometimes it is harder for small states to do the same kind of like modeling and leadership that larger states have just because of capacity, not because we're not doing the good work. But um, yeah, New York is an exceptional partner next door and we certainly work closely with them on those ideas and solutions. But didn't formally adopt a lead by example policy. I just have some more administrative type of questions. So you, you talked about July 1st. Is that when you hear about the grant programs? Or is yes, July 1st of 2024. We'll find out if we got our 100 million. <laughs> and then um, are those charts available to the public? Yes, all charts available to the public. Um, and we see there everything to do with the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant is on our, there's a public facing website on this on climatechange.vermont.gov. And one of the three banners is right now that grant opportunity. Of the, of the 99.8 million grants, is how much of that, is that all solid waste or is that solid waste in other sectors as well? No, it's um, the largest pots of money are actually for transportation and buildings and thermal. Um, so both um, transportation in particular at the end of this um, fiscal year, so at the end of June, state incentives that match federal incentives for electric vehicles are no longer funded in our budget. And so the hope is that there'll be a nice transition rate into these dollars having state incentives to make um, electric vehicles even more affordable for three more years, understanding that um, EV prices are coming down to match internal combustion engine vehicles for folks, ICE vehicles is what people call them, um, but the price is not competitive yet, so we're still trying to incentivize people buying them as much as possible. And then in the buildings and thermal sector, there's a lot of funding for uh, low-income Vermonters um, to weatherize their homes, but we put a lot of money in understanding that the rate of weatherization we need, we need to um, incentivize moderate income Vermonters in making those um, upgrades to your homes as well. And so the, that's like 70 million of the 100 million, and I believe solid waste is somewhere between five and 10 of that, 100 million. All right, well thank you so much, Jane, again. And as uh, Emma Stuhl comes up, I'm going to switch out the slides and share my screen. Um.
and then just stay on this side so you don't yes. trip over the cord. Okay, thank and you. the the slide will be made available online as a PDF, so everyone will be able to access the the slides that were shared today. Um, okay, share my screen. All right, Shannon, are we? Can you see that? Excellent. Awesome. Apologies again for that. Um, all right, so Emma Stuhl works with a team of the De Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's Waste Management and Prevention Division to help all of Vermont recycle better, compost more, and reduce and manage materials and waste. Before joining DEC, Emma worked as an ecologist, a program coordinator, and an environmental and sustainability educator throughout the Northeast. So Emma, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to your report. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, nodding. OK, just tell me if I need to get louder or if I'm being too loud. Um, I get excited sometimes. So I am so excited to be here with y'all in person and online. Really exciting day. And um, I am going to be telling you about some of the things that have happened in Vermont this past year in the world of the organics, some of the successes and the challenges, and also we're gonna look at some of what's coming in the next year. And as you can imagine, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything that's happening, so there's great chances to learn about more projects um, in the program the rest of the week. But if we have time in the Q&A, also, if folks want to just share a sentence or two with all of us about something else that happened in the world of organics last year or that's upcoming in the year ahead, I will invite you to do that um, to help this be a bit more comprehensive. And let's see, um, I think that will, yeah, start us off. So before I really get into it though, I do just wanna make a plug for the second annual Scrap Food Waste Challenge. Um, starting September 9th, and um, Alyssa and some other folks from our department are running it. It's a fun, uh, self-directed challenge that helps folks figure out what food they're wasting in their lives, because we always food, and then helps folks figure out how to waste less, because wasting less food is a climate solution in a way that we can all take action every day. Um, and through savvy storage, careful cooking, and more, we can really uh, make an impact and also save money by not needing to buy as much food. Let's see, okay, so the year uh, 2024, 2023, 2024, we have uh, reached this exciting point where it's been almost 12 years since Vermont passed the universal recycling law, which included bans on, um, keep, bans that required food scraps to stay out of the trash and also leave in yard debris and clean wood. And it's been almost 10 years since Vermont's largest food producers, like hospitals, universities, have had to keep their food scraps out of the trash. And then the law rolled down and required smaller and smaller producers of food scraps, like big restaurants and then medium restaurants, to keep their food scraps out of the trash. And now food scraps have been banned for all of us across the state for almost four years. So just wanted to start with this because I feel like we can disagree, but I feel like we have passed the brand new stage that like, this is a pretty new law, but it's not a brand new law. And I think that that's something that this community and everyone who's contributing to the work that it takes to make this happen should feel excited about and can feel pride in. We made it over the brand new law hump. So we'll start off with some signs of success and just celebrating some of the work that's been done and the milestones that have been reached. So, you know, many hundreds, and I would assume thousands, but I don't have data to back it up, Many hundreds of people have um, small-scale backyard composting bins or community garden composting bins and are managing their food scraps locally in their yards and in their neighborhoods successfully without issues. Vermont has over 100 food scrap drop-offs across the state, um, and many, many, many people are using those successfully and happily. And there's new ones. Um, uh, well, there's, well, I'll just, Pause there. Um, <laughs> one, uh, one challenge I want to acknowledge, though, which some of you I'm sure are very familiar with, is that um, backyard composting is not a good option for many people. It's a great option for some people, not for other people. And some parts of the state have more drop-offs than other parts of the state. 
And some parts of the state have free or very low cost drop-offs, and other parts of the state it costs enough that that's really a barrier and fewer people are using the, um, the drop-offs for that reason. So there's you know successes here, but there's also opportunities and also challenges here. So you know that's sort of our theme for today. It's like, wow, we've done so great, and there's opportunities for more work to do, and um, there are some challenges along the way. Let's see, so um, Vermont now has three times as many food scrap hauling companies as it had in 2012 when the universal recycling law was passed. And Natasha asked me how that has changed just in this last year. So I looked back and we saw a really large growth in companies around the 2020 food scrap ban. And then in the year since, it really has just gone up and down just a little bit. Um, you know, one to two or three businesses changing over the years. And our department maintains a list of food scrap haulers at vtrecycles.com who are wanting to advertise their services. So if you know of anyone who wants to be added or subtracted or updated, please be in touch. Okay, another success I want to um, celebrate is just how much coaching and problem solving and one-on-one -on -one and small-scale support is available and has happened in Vermont and is going to continue to happen, I would assume. And many folks in this room here today are part of this, um, this, this community effort that really has been essential and makes a big difference. So I'm just going to do shout outs for a few of the folks. And if you are not one of the ones like lumped into these groups I'm mentioning, I want to thank you also. And just to, like know that I can list everyone. So thank you for your work and your service. OK, so Vermont solid waste management entities have played a big part in this. Every town in the state has obligations, solid waste obligations they have to fulfill. Many towns have teamed up together to fulfill those obligations regionally. And these um, SWIMIs, solid waste management entities, um, provide information and assistance. Some of them sell discounted or add com cost composting bins in their communities, provide free backyard composting workshops. Some of them offer grants in their communities, and several of them also run facilities, and some of them are here today if you'd like to ask more about their programs. So they're playing a large role in their communities, and part of the work that the SWIMIs do and our department also does is um, doing outreach to businesses in schools. So there's a lot of effort into getting the message out to residents across the state, but there's also a lot of effort every year um, in getting you know information and also a, like system set up at larger producers of food scraps like the businesses and schools. And so then, yeah, on the residential side of things, and for businesses, our department also maintains a lot of resources that can hopefully be helpful across the state, including a website that's like overrun with information. So we're always happy to send people direct links if you're looking for something specific. We have a social media presence on Facebook and Instagram. Um, handouts, we have that food scrap hauler list, inspirational materials, yeah, lots of resources available, and feel free to come take things at our table. Yeah, stickers, bin signs, FAQs, lots, lots to offer. So what I would say to all of you is if you um, are out in your communities and there's some sort of need and you're like, wow, if I could only just provide this, this would be really helpful. In my community, maybe this would be useful to someone else in the state, you should feel free to be in touch with us. Because over the years, as we've had capacity to sort of improve and increase Vermont's library of resources, we've been able to do that. Um, so we, you know, we learn what what's needed from from many of you. Okay. Also, the Vermont Master Composter Program has had a big impact in the state. Um, the class has been program has been operating for 20 years and has taught an in-depth backyard composting course to over a thousand Vermonters. Do we have master composters in here? Can folks raise hands? Yes, lots of them. Okay, great. Yeah. And um, so the, the program has a class, and then there's also a volunteer component where some of the students commit to um, serving in their communities a certain number of hours each year and um, doing projects or providing assistance in their communities. And just to give you a snapshot of the impact, in 2022, there were 85 volunteers registered, and of that, 37 of them reported about 730 hours of service and reaching over a thousand people directly and then through newsletters and other like social media and other um, not in person to person contacts reaching another 19,000 people. So this is 
um, yeah, just a great support system for our communities. You know, these volunteers are providing boots on the ground work to like actually make compost happen, and they're also getting people the support and information they need to do their own composting. Okay, and then I definitely want to also give a shout out to the Composting Association of Vermont and Natasha Duarte, who do so much every year. And in addition to hosting boards, Natasha tells me some of the big, some of the big projects this past year were an on-farm community-oriented food scrap composting project, the Soil Builders course, a school compost program, and more. And I think there are chances to learn a bit more about some of Cap's work in some of the other sessions um, the rest of this week. So CAP is kind of a good transition point to switch from thinking about, you know, how do residents keep their food scraps out of the trash um, to thinking about the facilities that are managing large quantities of food scraps and what's happening in their world because CAP supports, you know, the really small-scale composting and also these larger facilities. So um, one, you know, update in the world of large facilities is that um, the Agency of Agriculture and Food and Markets has taken over the regulation of four larger on-farm composting operations. So we've updated our map of um, composting, larger composting um, facilities and operations in the state, and it's on our website for folks who you know, are, want to look at it more closely. But you can see we have a lot of larger composting operations in the state, and similar to the small scale, you can see certain parts of the state have more options than others. Um, so this is you know, both a success and potentially an opportunity, perhaps a challenge for some. So let's see. Um, one other exciting thing in the world of large-scale composting is that the Vermont Compost Operator Training Course, which our department um, helps sponsor so it can be a lower cost course, uh, is back to being in person also, which is just very exciting. And I've been told that, you know, part of the class is um, is a practicum at a compost facility, so it's just so great to be back, to be in person. So if you know anybody who needs some training on larger scale composting, you should check out this class and see if it could be a good fit. Um, and it's an annual course. And then our department also to support the larger scale composting world offers free compost technical assistance um, and this can be for compost facilities or on-farm compost facilities, but also if there's a school or a transfer station or some other entity that's managing a larger amount of food scraps on site, they might be eligible for this program. So this past year, um, eight compost sites received about 100 hours of technical assistance, free no cost assistance through this program. So if you know somebody who needs assistance, you can be in touch with um, benjamin.gov or acromont.gov to see if it's a good fit. Um, okay, and then this is not hot, hot off the presses. I know some folks have seen this already, but it's pretty recent, so I still wanted to just sort of um, sit with it and share it for folks who haven't heard. So last year, 2023, a team at University of Vermont um, published a study where they did a survey on the impact of Vermont's food-based ban on residents and food businesses, and they learned all sorts of interesting things, and they have a very like digestible and user-friendly um, summary of their findings, so I suggest checking that out online. Um, but two takeaways from it for me were that uh, 85, they found that 85% of Vermonters are composting in some way or another, and that 61% feel a moral obligation to keep food scraps out of the trash. So I know I said it's not a brand new law, but four years is actually very recent, and composting was totally new for many people in the state at that point. You know, not for, many people have been doing it for decades, but it was totally new for many people in the state, so I think 85% of folks composting in some way or another is something to, to celebrate and to feel, sort of some, feel some momentum from there. Um, and then the more obligation, you know, is more motivating. So saying like, okay, more than half of our community is reporting that they have this sort of deeper motivation to keep the food scraps out and they understand why it matters to keep their food scraps out of the trash. I think that's something to, yeah, like feel some momentum from and feel, feel some, some uh, excitement about it, yeah. Okay, so a nice little pump up before we talk about challenges. So, you know, the world is full of challenges and they create opportunities. So one challenge that many of you have probably heard about is uh, that Vermont has been experiencing more um, bare human conflicts in recent years. And 
Um, the understanding is that bears have been learning more that humans are a source of food and associating people with food and even like, teaching their young that people are a source of food. So um, we as a whole state really have to keep, you know, work hard and like keep working hard on making sure we're not feeding bears accidentally. And we learned somewhere recently that almost half or maybe around, yeah, around half of the conflicts had to do with bears getting into trash. So I think like historically there sometimes was a sense of like bears get into trash. It just happens. But really what we need to do is say like, oh no, we need to make sure bears don't get into trash. And what we've learned in some other states is that in communities where bears are not getting into trash or into food scraps, up like when enough of the community has bear resistant containers, they stop having so many bear problems. So um, yeah, the rest of the conflicts are sort of evenly divided between other attractants like honeybees, uh, chickens, compost, food scraps, uh, bird seed. So I feel like the composting community, we've done, a, you know, we've had a real focus on this for years and there's been a lot of energy put into messaging about like composting with bears in mind and making sure your food scraps are, you know, you're being strategic with how you manage your food scraps, but there is more opportunity there. So. I will say we've had some successes in this space, and we are seeing increasingly, um, increasingly seeing folks making their trash and food scrap management systems bear resistant and more bear resistant. Whether they're using um, bear resistant dumpsters or storing food scraps in like sturdy metal and wood containers, or protecting them with electric fencing, um, sort of. You know, as, as more and more of our materials are stored securely, that will just help us move along. So, and I think this one on the bottom right is really great for folks who are compost educators out in their community. So somebody had these already, and so they had an electric fence, and so then they just were like, oh, I'll just do my composting inside that electric fence, which is just so great. Um, and if anybody, I guess, well, I'll pause. So yeah, I'd like to just recruit all of you here today. If you're not already spreading the message about this, if you feel comfortable joining the community of people who um, are just sort of encouraging managing food scraps and compost and trash with bears in mind, um, to join, yeah, join the join the, the the norming that needs to happen in our state to shift us in that direction. So if you need tips or you want to send anybody to tips. Um, our Dirt on Compost booklet, which is at the table and also available at btrecycles.com on the Food Scraps webpage, has the last few pages are just um, simple tips for backyard composting systems and small scale composting systems. And then if you're out talking to um, anyone who has carts that they're um, pulling, or carts for, for collecting trash or food scraps, we also have a tip sheet that's focused on protecting those carts from bears. And many of these tips are um, also sort of simple. You know, some of them take more effort, but some of them are pretty simple things. So you can look through it, sort of use it as a menu to try to just improve your system. Okay, thank you for joining the bear prevention journey. Okay, <laughs> another challenge that I imagine many of you are familiar with is contamination, and especially plastic ending up in food scraps or in compost. So a lot of work has been done in this space and there's more work to be done and more work coming. So um, our department for like the residents and general public did a um, media campaign a few years ago trying to you know, promote the message that yes, it does matter if there's plastic in your food scraps and yes, you really should you know, care about taking those produce stickers off. And then um, there's a bunch of initiatives at sort of a larger scale. So. Uh, for the facilities, compost facilities that DEC regulates, they each have facility management plans. And when they get recertified, they often update their facility management plans. So in this upcoming round of um, recertifications, the facilities are going to be adding protocols to audit loads for contamination. So this could look a lot of different ways, but for example, a facility might say, we're going to audit loads every so often, and we will you know, decide what level of contamination we can manage through these various means. And if they're you know, more contaminated than this, we'll provide education. And we even could have the option to charge fees or even refuse loads that are too contaminated. And there will be some steps about needing to contact DC in those cases so that DC and or the compost facility you know, provide education and are able to fix the problem. Because you know the producers of food scraps are the ones that are 
putting in the contamination. So we really just like all have to be connected and work together to work through this. So as part of all this piece, he's going to be updating and creating some new guidance. So you can stay tuned on that if that's your world or if you're interested. And then also in 2022, the legislature passed Act 170, an act relating to the regulation of depackaging facilities. And a stakeholder group met and produced a report on, with recommendations. And then this past year, DEC also provided a report to the legislature that um, included um, answering some specific questions and providing specific information. And then as part of this also, there's DC's gonna be releasing a guidance and policy um, soon, I've been told, on the source separation of organics. And it did get delayed by the flood, so I know some folks are wondering when it's coming, and I've been told it is coming soon. So another piece is that a pollution prevention study is happening right now, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then the next step is that DEC is going to be um, going through the rulemaking process for food waste management facilities, including depackagers. So you can stay tuned on that, and um, there will be ways to you know, chime in and participate in that process. So the pollution prevention study is in partnership with the EPA, and it has two parts. One part is um, working with Vermont food and beverage manufacturers and developing ways to reduce PFAS and microplastics in their process processes, and then the other part is studying PFAS and microplastics at a depackager, an anaerobic digester, in a compost facility. And in looking and investigating, is there PFAS and or microplastic pollution in these settings, you know, beyond the baseline of what is out in the world, unfortunately? And then if there is, working to reduce that pollution. So one challenge for this study that the team is working through is that there's not a standard way currently to sample and analyze microplastics in organics, whether that's a high organic slurry from an anaerobic digester or in other organic materials. So stay tuned, the journey continues. They're working on, on this and on um, yeah, working towards the goals of this study. Okay, so those are some of the big challenges of the past and the future. I know many of you will be working on those this upcoming year. So we're going to just um, wrap up our journey by looking at the data and saying, okay, so you know we know all these good things are happening. We know there's some challenges, but like our food scraps staying out of the trash. What's happening in Vermont? So we can look at this from two sides. One side is we can say what's in the trash and what can we learn from that. So every five years, our department uh, hires specialists to come to Vermont and to sample our trash across the state and over um, a few times of the year and to use what they find in the sampling to estimate what is in our trash across the state. So it's like a snapshot. What happened to this past year? And 2023 was the year, so the sampling happened and we're pretty close to having a final report. So if you are someone who wants to dive deep into the final report, it will be coming, I think, like in the next like two months, maybe is my estimate. <laughs> um, but I'll give you a little sneak peek here, and I know some of you are gonna wanna like zoom in and look at everything, but we're just gonna focus on the food scraps, sorry. So, okay, um, in Vermont's MSW, municipal solid waste, which is uh, residential business institution, sort of like generic trash. They found that about 19% of the trash was food waste, and pet, le pet waste, leaves, and other organics made up about 9% of the trash. So if you're like me, you might say, hey, that's nice, Emma, but what, is that, like, what does that really mean? Other than like a slice of pie, it's a pretty big slice of pie. So we can look at that a few different ways. So one is to think about tonnage. So that is going to bring us to an estimate of about 70,000 tons of food scraps that were landfilled in 2020. Three, and if we think about the um, greenhouse gas impacts of those food scraps ending up in the landfill where anaerobic uh, microbes do break them down a little bit and release methane, if we had been able to, rip, to get those food scraps out of the trash and manage them in another way, it would have reduced greenhouse gas emissions as much as taking 9,000 vehicles off the road. So my takeaway is, that's a lot of food scraps still going in the trash, and there's a lot of opportunity there to get uh, to get some climate action, to get some greenhouse benefits uh, via the work of getting those food scraps out of the trash. So compared to five years ago, the 2018 study, that 70,000 though is uh, 
10,500 tons fewer food scraps landfills. So that's kind of exciting. So the benefit of getting that, you know, over 10,000 food scraps out of the trash is uh, equivalent to removing about 1,500 passenger vehicles from the road every year. So what I take from it, and you can take different things, is like, okay, there's still a lot of food scraps going into the trash, and wow, it looks like we made a pretty big dent. And this law is not brand new, but it is still pretty new, and we know there's more work to do, but like all of our efforts have made a big difference. And you know, it's a difference that's persisting every year. So that's looking at the trash. So the other side of the <laughs> other side of the equation is a little more complicated. We can look at what we know about how food scraps are being diverted from the trash. And diversion is the materials management jargon for you know, not managed in a way other than the trash. And um, the data here is more complicated. So DEC does collect data from regulated compost facilities, so the ones that DEC regulates, from regulated drop-offs, transfer stations, et cetera. We have a partial estimate about the food residuals that are managed through anaerobic digestion. And every year, the Vermont Food Bank gives us an estimate of the food donations that they've received that, received that they consider to be rescued food. So food that, before the universal recycling law went into effect, and grocery stores had to start keeping their food and food scraps out of trash, that food was going in the trash. And then um, since the universal recycling law, folks have been donating it. So they give us an estimate of that. And then we do have, an, uh, I would say, like a useful but rough estimate of the backyard composting that's happening in the state. We did a survey as part of this most recent waste composition study and one in the year, one before. And I think it's like a very useful ballpark estimate, but there are some assumptions built into it. So I'd say take it with a grain of salt there. Because, you know, I compost in my, not me, but you know, someone might compost in their backyard, but maybe they go in the winter. Or maybe somebody, you know, composts whenever they're home, but they're not composting their food scraps at work, for example. So there's just a bunch of assumptions built in to try and figure out, like, how do we think about the many ways humans engage? Okay, so what we're missing here, though, is a lot. We don't have data for the food scraps managed through on-farm composting, or through animal feeding, or through other smaller compost sites that aren't these big regulated facilities, or through other food rescue that is happening directly, not through the Vermont Food Bank. So just what I'm gonna tell you, just keep in mind the whole time, like, there's actually more food uh, diversion happening than this. That said, we can look at what we do now. So it takes a lot of time to collect all the data and to sort through it and to quality check it. So 2022 is our most recent year, but you can see pretty excitingly that this matches what we're seeing on the um, trash side of things, that there is a lot more diversion happening of food scraps. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what comes next year. And let's see, also as part of the waste composition study, um, the contractors did a food scrap hauler survey. So thank you if any of you talked to them. And they were not able to talk to everybody, but from their research, they are estimating that at least another 5,000 tons of organics are being uh, diverted every year that aren't reporting to us through some way. So there's a lot of diversion happening also. So you know, what do you do with this? If we put it together and we add up the diversion we know about and the disposal that we know about, we can think about a recovery rate, like what's getting recovered and what's out there. And this is part of the waste composition study also, and in that study we actually present a range because there, a bunch of these things are estimates, so you know it's not so clean as to say 54%. But to make your lives easier today for this one minute, we're going to look at, look at the diversion being about 54% and the disposal being about 46% when we think about food residuals and food scraps. But as I said before, it's actually, it's actually better than this. We just don't know how much better. So, you know, you were probably sitting there saying, okay, like, what are my key takeaways? So this just brings us back, I think, to the theme from the beginning, which was that we've made a lot of progress and there's a lot to be proud of, and I think there's a lot of momentum to carry us forward, and there's still opportunity for us to get more food scraps out of the trash. You know, they're there, these opportunities are there. So um, with that, I just want to uh, thank you all for your work, whether it's really small scale or whether you're working at a big scale in your you know, personal professional lives, and yeah, I think one thing that is 
uh, exciting about the composting and organic diversion space is that it is such a space of collective action. So it's just really wonderful to be in community together with people who care about this and are motivated. And um, yeah, so just thank you. And I think we will have time for, yes, we do have time for a few questions. And then if we have time also, if people want to share just like, you know, one to two sentences about other things that have happened in the past year or that are coming up in the year to come, we can do that too. Okay, thank you. from Zoom is regarding that 2023 waste composition study that you mentioned. Were you able to identify where a majority of the food scraps were coming from? Was it residential, industry, etc.? Okay, that is a good question. And the final report will have a breakdown of what, um, what materials are coming from a residential stream and what are coming from a commercial stream. And I don't remember it off the top of my head. My memory is it's like 40, 60, but I can't remember which way it is. I'm looking at a list and see if she I think the food scraps remembers. are really similar. Oh, okay. Areas. Okay, Alyssa's memory is that it's similar. We'll yeah. Have to check. Um, but if you're interested in more details, yes, the final report should be coming. Soon, and as always, I know I said this before, but I know there's a lot on our website, so anyone's always welcome to contact me at amadatschool at vermont.gov, and I can you know, send you direct links for things that you're looking for. Great. Okay. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I was just curious um, about that bar chart with the green bar showing the diversion. A few slides back, that one, yeah. You just one forward. Oh, one forward. Um, oh. And if you have any information on the breakdown among the different sectors of diversion, so like charitable food sector, or I guess food bank in your case. I do, and I ran out of time to put it in, but now we get to talk about it, because you're interested. So. <laughs> okay, and then my follow-up is with the uh, Vermont State's food, food waste hierarchy of prioritizing feeding that food to humans and animals. Um, I understand it's really complex for the state to enforce that, but I was wondering if anything's being done on that end to prioritize getting salvageable food waste to humans and animals and just composting food scraps. And I noticed also throughout the presentation there were um, just the, the words food waste and food scraps seem to be interchanged. Um, and I was wondering if that's consistent in policy or if you make a distinction between food waste and food scraps. Okay, great detail. It should say food scraps everywhere. Thank you. I missed that. I would say. So no, it's not, um, let's see, uh, I can't speak to the, can you say the policy question again? Um, just if the state has interest or is working on kind of reflecting that food waste hierarchy yes. in um, yes. the diversion efforts okay. and making sure that salvageable food is being um, if the people who eat it or animals. Yeah. Okay, I will answer, and then if anyone else um, who has been involved wants to um, improve my answer, I invite you to, which is that my understanding is that that is going to be part of the source separation of organics policy and guidance that is coming soon, and then that there will be like a, a rollout of what that looks like um, across the state. And then in terms of where the um, food scraps are coming from for 2022, um, you can see the home composting estimate is a pretty big chunk. And then food processing, oh, sorry, see, then the slide didn't make it in, so I formatted it. Anyway, food processing residuals um, is another large chunk. And then food scraps that are being collected and managed not through a home or backyard compost system is a pretty big chunk. And then there's a small amount of depackaged, I mean, not that small, it's pretty big, but relatively amount of depackaged food tons and food bank rescue also. And so then the food bank rescue, as I mentioned, is just from Vermont Food Bank. So there's some things that are missing from that. And then, as we've mentioned, also the on-farm composting and smaller on-site composting systems 
and animal feed are all missing from that. So we know, I mean, we know that animal feed can be really a huge piece of the puzzle, especially in certain parts of Vermont where it's really common for there, you know, to be a pig bucket and then also a food scrap bucket. Um, so yeah, that's not part of the data we have. Yeah, Ben, can you add? I just wanted to add to the policy piece on Ben got there working the Can you get the oh, microphone over there? Second. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to add to the policy piece. Uh, so part of the Act 170 requirements, we're supposed to evaluate whether or not the hierarchy needs any bolstering or support. So we're going to be looking at that as part of our rulemaking coming up, and, and we're potentially implementing new policy uh, to that as needed. So that might be something that, an opportunity for public participation at that point. Thank you, Ben. Can you pass it over to Alyssa? Here, and maybe Ann, too. Thank you. <laughs> Get to hear from the whole crew. Yeah, just to answer your other question about terminology. So we do use wasted food, like food waste, as like the broadest bucket. So we think about food scraps as more of like what we would all be producing, as opposed to like food processing residuals, which are from the manufacturing sector, but we include both of them under like the food waste. And then we've also, since the depackager started operating in 2021, um, we're also tracking the depackage, so the packaged food that was then went through the depackager separate. So we have like those three buckets. And then the food bank rescue, even though that's not being wasted, it's being eaten, we still count it in diversion because we still have the data. And if you do have any more questions, feel free to email me about the data. And I'm just going to add to that, and Ian, for sure, I also work with um, this team in waste management and prevention. And I just want to say that, you know, right before COVID, we were all really focused on getting the word out and um, providing outreach and education about the universal recycling law and the priority for keeping food out of the landfill. So, you know, really prioritizing food donation and food rescue. And then COVID came and, you know, we kind of took a step back in all of our outreach. And I mean, luckily Vermont has a really robust group of folks that are really focused on feeding people, and so they kind of stepped in and did a lot of that. But we're just getting back to getting more out into the public, and so hopefully you'll you'll see us more um, really encouraging the food donation part of, of the puzzle. And as you can see, waste is really complex, so thanks for <laughs> hanging in there with us. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much, Emma and Katie. <laughs> thank you. I missed the very last part of that because um, we were just troubleshooting here for a minute. Um, get that off. Um, so um, I am going to invite Sally Brown, who's our keynote, to, to share her screen, and Dan Goosen to come up to introduce her. And, um, and then uh, hopefully the speaker view and Zoom will figure out while that's happening. So don't mind me if I'm moving around behind here and watch yourself on the court. Yes. Okay, you have to enable me to share my screen. Oh, Dean, uh, hang on one second. Um, I'm gonna have to plug, unplug you and plug in the local mic to, for us to be able to hear Sally. I think I can try it. Uh, why are we accepting? Well, all that is happening. Uh, I just want to also thank Emma. That was a great overview of what's going on in the state, and there is a lot going on. But holy cow, 46 or was it 48 percent on the left side of that pie chart is a much bigger number than I realized. Um, so there's a lot to be done out there, and I think it's going to take all of us. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity if we all work together with haulers, generators, regula regulators, policymakers local municipalities, I think we all play a really important role in trying to figure out how to reduce that number further, those tons that are still going to the landfill and creating methane. Um, and with that, there's going to be more and more challenges with contaminants. And um, those of us who take on compost, take on food scraps, food waste, and food processing residuals over the last many decades, we've been, it's been uh, usually through folks who have been doing it voluntary until the last decade. So prior to that, those, for those, there are people who have been doing it for decades, you know, like 10, 20, 30 years, uh, our bigger universities and schools, and they do it really well. And looking at compost 
quality in other states in the country, Vermont, com Vermont made compost uh, is really good stuff. And it's because we have that voluntary ethic of uh, reducing landfill streams and keeping stuff out of the landfill and putting it to good use. So as we look to get to that extra percentage um, that is still going to the landfill, I think that's gonna be our biggest challenge is trying to make sure that the people who are participating in that all through the chain are doing the work required to make sure that uh, the quality remains high and that the contamination doesn't overwhelm us. So we're all gonna to need to pitch in on that effort. All right, uh, moving on, we are going to introduce Sally. Oh, there she is, look at that. Um, so <laughs> Sally is not, Sally Brown, for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, is a big name in the compost industry. Those, uh, hopefully, many of you are aware of BioCycle, which is the industry leading um, publication. It's been around for a very long time. It is no longer in print as of a couple years ago, but it still comes to your inbox regularly. If you're signed up, if you are not, you should sign up. And every month, I believe it's every, well, maybe it's not quite every issue, but a regular feature in that is an, a calling from uh, Sally Brown. Um, Sally, Dr. Sally Brown is a research associate professor in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Washington in Seattle, where it is three hours earlier than it is here. So thank you, Sally, for waking up early for this. And a fellow in the Cell Soil Science Society of America. She was recently appointed to the USDA Committee on Urban and Innovative Agriculture and writes the Connections column for BioCycle, as I mentioned. Sally focuses on soil amendments, in situ rem uh, remediation, and carbon sequestration. So perfect for our topic this week um, and this month and this year with a focus on the climate connection. With her research partners. Uh, I can't hear anything. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We can hear you. Hold on. Um. You should, Sally, can you? Now I, now I can hear. Okay. All right. Make some noise if you can, if it goes out again. But we're, I will. we're introducing you, we're almost there, uh, getting through your bio. Um, you can stop, people, it's not that interesting. It's, <laughs> oh, and Sally's also very humorous, which we're, is good for us. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm almost done. Let's see, ILSR, she helped with the Compost Climate Connections webinar series, which came out recently, you can still find online. And she co-authored CREF's publication, uh, The Compost and Climate Connection, which is also available from the U.S. Composting Council. Authored dozens of published papers on the benefits of compost, and we are very uh, happy that even though she's not able to join us in person this time, that we get to still share uh, her face and her voice coming to us straight from Seattle. So without further ado, Dr. Sally Brown, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me, and thank you for letting me do it from my couch. I will <laughs> say that um, I'm outside of Seattle in the mountains, but it is it has been snowing this morning, which is great in December um, and not nearly as nice when it's almost May. So... <laughs> Um, I'd much rather be inside now talking to you guys than outside gardening. Um, I was first there in 2013. It was a great conference and a great visit, and I was a lot younger then. Um, and I went back and I looked at the presentation. I thought, oh, I did a good job. Oh, wait, what else do I have to say? This is, this is you know, methane from landfilling food scraps. Um, and here it is, deja vu all over again. I, I'm better now at making graphs, but this is from that presentation. And basically on a dry weight basis, I, I said that, boy, you get a lot of methane when you landfill food scraps. And what has happened since then, EPA pieces together from a range of studies. And in this last year said, you know what? you get a lot of methane when you landfill food scraps. Now, it's really wonderful that they, this is a figure from EPA, and it's really wonderful because when I started with this, EPA had landfill gas collection efficiency at 100% for the life of the landfill. Um, We've made huge progress since then. There's there's more progress to be made. 
Uh, there have been studies recently that have real-time methane measurements from landfills, and by God, they do emit methane. But the fact that warm model now explicitly connects landfilling food scraps with methane emissions and that warm says oh, close to 60% of the methane emissions from landfills come from food scraps is critical. This is this is a real bit of progress. Now, um, since I was last here, there's been a lot of water under the bridge. This is a bad pun for something that I hope was much worse in the New York Times than um, in reality, but uh, climate change has hit Vermont and and I'm really sorry about that. Um, but on a on a wonderful note, and this was talked about um, by the last speaker, you guys, you passed the law in 2012, long before EPA put pieces together, went into effect in 2020. This is um, from Biocycle. Congratulations. Um, it's fabulous. Um, and I have to get a bad Star Trek reference in here. Um, so in much less time from when Jean-Luc first started to say, make it so, and the last season of Picard, you guys have, have traveled at warp speed to get this done. <laughs> um, sorry, but couldn't help it. Um, and based on a study at a University of Vermont, um, looking at how many people say, according to the survey, um, that food scraps are being separated from trash, the number has grown significantly. So people there are are walking the walk. They're not just talking the talk, and that's pretty amazing. Um, another bad pun. Anybody recognize this family? Yes. Are the hills alive there? Come on, guys. Okay, the Von Trapp family and Julie Andrews. Um, anyway, uh, according to Biocycle, we're talking about 50,000 tons of food waste annually. If you take this estimate of how many tons of CO2 equivalent from EPA for diverting um, food scraps, that's methane avoidance, that gives you this many tons of CO2E, 43,000, or 66 kilograms um, per person. So everybody can chalk that up as a personal accomplishment, 66 kilograms of CO2E just from following the rules and taking your food scraps out, which is fabulous. Now, that was a survey um, of what people say they do. Um, and what people actually do and what people say they do can be different. Um, for example, how far did you say you ran last week versus how <laughs> I know this from personal, not getting into my own. Anyway, um, in Seattle, we've had food scrap separation for over 15 years. And it's one of the longest running and most successful programs in the country. Here's some literature from SPU, Seattle Public Utilities. Here's what we have to do to get um, compost right. And from a paper we recently did with someone, Kate Kurtz from Seattle Public Utilities, we looked at not how, what percentage participate, but estimates of, of those that participate how much that could go into the compost bin actually does. And it's good, but it's it's far from universal compliance. So in Seattle, about half the people live in single family homes and the participation rate is high, but only about 50% of what could go in that green bin actually does. Um, this is single family and this is tons of nitrogen. Um, I could have shown it as tons of food scraps of the potential, but you can see the gray is going into the landfill and the green is what is actually captured. Now, um, this is with about 80 to 90% participation. Um, you guys, Vermont, about 71% of the people live in single family homes. So we got room to grow here in Seattle. If you look at multifamily, it's even more sobering. 
Um, the quantities of food scraps here are much lower in the multifamily homes, um, but the quantity diverted is about 10%. So until you have a good solid grasp, real counting and weighing people's trash, pat yourselves on the back, but don't consider it a job completely done. Um, if it holds true that multifamily doesn't do as well as single family, you're in luck because only about 30% of the people in Vermont live in multifamily homes. Now, based on the survey that was done, a lot of people say that they compost in their backyard or give friends and neighbors their food scraps to compost. And that can be great. Um, but I've been in Vermont. I went to college right near Bennington, not in Bennington, but near Bennington. And I know that you always have mud season. In fact, you should be fast approaching mud season if not in it. Is that true? Yeah. I Close. Yeah. I heard some, some, some voices there. And you, you sometimes have winter, right? We're having winter today, but sometimes yeah. you actually have a whole season. Now, the 46% of the people that either compost themselves or give it to neighbors that compost, um, this is our old compost bin. You can see we went very high tech back in the day. Um, home composting is great in June when you're all excited about it and it's warm out. Um, it's much harder to turn those piles when they're frozen. It's much harder to make yourself go outside and dump your food scraps when you got the wood stove going inside and it's muddy, cold, and nasty outside. So a uh, pile that's only turned occasionally can result in elevated methane emissions. A uh, pile where you don't contribute everything because who wants to go out there is not nearly as effective. So now I'm gonna go through different stages of talking about how you can polish what is already a hugely successful effort in Vermont. And so one of the things that you've seen all around in the market, and I know Casella is, is embracing this, um, there's a whole range of new, um, new appliances that you never knew existed and that you never knew you needed, but having tried several of these, these can be transformative and on a household level, they can be really helpful. Um, they primarily dry and grind food scraps. This one is from, this is from mill.com. And as your food scraps are 80% water, when you take that water out, all of a sudden, instead of this, you end up with a very small amount. Um, mill is one of the number of, of a number of these, um, food cycler is another great one. Um, one thing I like about food cycler and mill is they don't say they make compost. Whereas Lomi, another one of these says it makes compost. Renical is another one that says they make compost. Um, they dry and grind the food waste. And it's amazing because at the end of a cycle, you have a stable material that you can put in a bag that has minimal odor. I know that the mill is gets hot enough to reach PFRP, which is another thing that's really nice about it. Um, the emissions associated with these are electricity. If you're in Indiana where they burn coal, it's not so good, but in Vermont, you have a very low CO2E for power. So this is a tool to get people more aware of, well, let's not, Let's, let's phrase that a little differently. To make it easier for people to comply with food scrap diversion, it also works pretty well to stop contamination because you can see it in your bin. Um, this is not compost. As I said earlier, one of the things I hate about Lomi and Ron Alexander called this out at the last USCC meeting when the Lomi guy stood up, um, if you get this stuff wet again, and here's stuff from a food cycler from my house, got it wet again, came back and it was moldy and stinky. And in a day or two, the fruit flies would have started. Um, this is not compost. So for people to think it's compost, cause it looks kind of sort of like compost, you can get into trouble. 
Um, but one of the things that's wonderful about it, and this has been certified, tested, and approved, um, it can be chicken food. And so for us, um, this is our dried food grounds. This is our neighbor's standard chicken feed. These are our neighbor's chickens. And this is my mill. You notice I don't have it in as lovely a place as in the ad. And the dog food is right in front, as is the old paint can. But this is what it looks like inside. This is the material. You'll get this from any of these devices. And this is my payback. We trade with our neighbor food scraps and we get hurt chicken eggs. And if you look at the EPA food pyramid, feeding animals is a little bit higher than compost or anaerobic digestion. And in Vermont, I think there's quite a few backyard chickens. So this could be a really good deal for homeowners um, to encourage composting, to reduce contamination, to make the process easier year round and to potentially make animal feed. Now, it also makes composting at home easier because you can store it till it's nice out. Now, you can also put this stuff directly into your soil, but you have to wait to plant it. Now, this is what this stuff is before it's dried and ground. This looks like soil and it looks like you might wanna plant into it. Would anybody self-respecting gardener put a seed into this? No way. So what you got to do is shovel it into your soil, come back in a month or two, depending on the season, and then you can plant. Um, so that's how you can, one tool to increase participation. Another thing that I found is um, much of the focus on food scrap diversion and on a policy level, this is, this is certainly really important. It's been on methane avoidance. And so if you're selling this behavior change as a uh, boy, let's avoid methane. Let's kill the world a little less quickly. That doesn't make you feel so good. But instead, what you could do is say, by diverting food scraps and using it as food for animals or even better food for the soil, you're also healing the earth. That's a message that can really resonate and, and make people really appreciate the good that they are doing. Um, regenerative agriculture is something people have now heard about, and that requires healthy soil. And the key to healthy soil is increased soil carbon. There's a Soil Health Institute now. Um, soil is by and large sexy now. There are books about soil. There's People are aware of soil. It's not sexy in a Sydney Sweeney kind of way to show you how old I am. I had to ask my son who the Farrah Fawcett modern day equivalent was, and that's how I know who Sydney Sweeney is. Um, but um, soil is sexy in a let's all help save the world, bring life back and keep eating food kind of way, which to me is has more longevity than either Farrah or Sydney. But that's just my opinion. Um, there are movies about soil. Kiss the Ground was the first one. There's another one that's recently out. Um, Woody Harrelson is telling you how wonderful soil is. Um, that that has some some impact. Um, soil carbon sequestration here. So in other words, the time for soil is now. Um, and when you sequester soil carbon you get both the bang of uh, a climate change mitigation strategy and you get improved soil health. This is dry land wheat, a uh, few hours from where I live and where I flush. Um, this is the field that got the biosolids and this is the field that didn't. And you can see this, you can see the difference in greenness. We've looked at satellite imagery. You can see the biosolids from space. And here you can see the enhance productivity and enhance health, enhance soil health via the greenness of the vegetation from space. And that's pretty cool. Um, most of the standard ways to increase soil carbon, um, as we look in greater detail, they don't pan out with depth. And, and that's literally um, cover crops and crimson and clover. Um, another great Tommy James song, there you go, another um, ages reference, but uh, <laughs> typically um, cover crops do really well 
for increasing soil organic carbon in the surface soil horizon uh, study a few years back at a UC Davis um, long-term study corn tomato rotation where they use cover cropping plus or minus poultry manure compost and did a deep soil sampling and corn tomato rotation. I had to put a picture in. These are my own little yellow cherry tomatoes. Anyway, with just the cover crop in the surface, boy, they got carbon storage. But when they sampled with depth, it turns out it was uh, robbing the bottom to pay the top. They ended up with a net loss of soil carbon. But when you put poultry manure compost in there, you ended up across the whole depth of sequestering about 22 tons of carbon. That's not CO2, that's just carbon. To get CO2, you multiply it by a lot across the depth. Mm -hmm. So let me get the right button here. Um, what studies are showing more and more is what's referred to as exogenous organic matter has panned out with depth as the best way to build soil organic matter. Um, here is um, one study, and it's based on a range of trials out of England, um, carbon per hectare per year based on a cumulative 20 ton loading over 20 years. So that's not a lot of material. Um, carbon from biosolids, 0.38, municipal solid waste, 0.18, green waste and biosolids, 0.39, and bio waste compost times 0.42. These are all big numbers. This is per hectare per year. That's one study. Um, another study, and this was long-term field sites across Europe, um, they reported it a slightly different way, but the amount of the added carbon that stays put, um, biosol 66, green waste compost 100%, MSW compost 82%. And here's some more aerial pictures of that dryland wheat study. You can see the fertilizer versus three tons per acre, you can see the difference in green and you can see that with compost. So the the key here is telling people, and it's, a, it's true, that not only do you stop killing the planet, you start helping to heal the planet. And the best way to do that with soil is with compost. And you can see the CO2 equivalents, um, and how much more effective it is than cover crops. This is from a biocycle column. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. So it's even wonderful enough that you're seeing states and agencies recognizing it, which is 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 nice. Um, California and Washington, two states that I know of that have soil health initiatives. Compost is an integral part of this. This is Washington State. Um, this is Deirdre Griffin Layu right here, who is in charge of the dryland wheat study that I was talking about. Um, and they want to develop technical or other approaches to overcome existing barriers to increase organic inputs, compost, manure, biosolids, and biochar. That's pretty nice. What's even nicer is the USDA NRCS has a code 336 soil carbon amendment where they're paying farmers to use compost. This is a very nice thing. This is available in all 50 states. A simple soil test is involved. Um, you have to see if it's being used and you have to talk to your state extension agent to get them to use it if it's not being used and outreach to farmers. Um, but it's very nice uh, that there's something on the books where um, you can get paid to use compost on a farm level. Um, anybody know who this woman is? Yep, Nora. Carrie Ocean Susan. That's Nora, yeah. Um, and those are some nice carrots that she's holding in her hand. Um, so a recognition of the importance of soils is a strong motivation for people to compost and divert food scraps. And it's a potentially a great way to sell more compost and get additional revenue from sales. Um, now, that was a way, these are two tools to get people to, to participate more. Um, these new appliances and, and talking about composting as a way to heal rather than kill less quickly. Um, now I'm gonna talk about 
ways as a compost industry, um, you can take advantage of this and um, maybe even make some more money, which is not always a bad thing. Uh, one of the things that we've done is look at a range of different blends that are catered to specific end users. And one of these end users is a home garden market. And this is Ryan Bajaika, who is a grad student who, for his master's thesis, grew a lot of petunias, and some grew very well, and some didn't do nearly as well. Um, and he used different blends, and our our gold standard here was a biosolids-based potting soil, and boy, did that grow nice petunias, but so did the yard waste vine and the biosolids, not so much with the biochar. Um, and so if you make and test products for how petunias respond, how tomatoes respond, how lilacs respond, um, you can specialize and increase sales of certain products. Another thing that's worked is the growth of urban agriculture, community gardens. This is Tacoma. This is um, a survey we did um, looking at uh, how big gardens were in Tacoma in the Harvest Pierce County program and how well they were used. And amazingly enough, there are a lot of um, community gardens in this in this region and people like learning how to grow from their neighbors and visiting with their neighbors and sharing food with their neighbors in a community garden setting. Each of these community gardens gets as much of Tagro and as much um, yard waste compost as they want. This is Kristen McIver, another former student who is head of this program for Harvest Pierce County. The compost and the biosolids potting soil are all given away. Tagro, the Tacoma Biosolids Program, I think is the only program in the country that has regularly run out of their product and that sales outside of the garden donations broke a million dollars this year. So um, community garden donations is a great way to get information out and customers out about your product, especially if you make a product that works well. And so don't just say it's great because it meets all regulatory requirements and you get your tip fees, make sure it's great because the plants grow well. Uh, another column, and there are a couple of columns about this study. This is Toby Una who worked on this. This was um, uh, one of the plots that we use fertilizer. And right behind her, you can see this is the plot where we use the biosolids compost mix. And if you're a gardener, which one would you use? It's uh, the plants are not lying here. Okay, now, so how to get people to do this better, how to get you guys that compost commercially to make more money, um, how to get you guys that compost professionally to help the planet. Um, one of the, the things aside from climate change, and in fact, in the, the planetary boundary study that came out a while back that is a little overwhelming, climate change, we're in bad shape, but not nearly as bad as we are in biodiversity loss that I can't help you with, but in the nitrogen cycle. We are fixing so much synthetic nitrogen and it's, it's having a very bad impact. So if you start looking at sources of fixed nitrogen, nitrogen that's already here and not in the atmosphere, one of the big sources are biosolids and septic tank pump outs. Now, um, this is a different paper we did and we looked at nutrient flows. Um, this is Tacoma where they had that, the community garden that I talked about and the biosolids program, it's so wonderful. Um, they don't compost any of their food waste there. And if you look at um, how much nitrogen is in the food waste. This is an estimate. Um, it's about 129, and I don't remember the units here. Um, I think it's 129 tons per year. The city has a population of a couple of hundred thousand. If you look at the amount of nitrogen that's going into the wastewater plant, this was our estimate. This was the actual. Um, some is going into the biosolids. 
and a great deal is going into the effluent. So if you took all of this nitrogen and were somehow able to capture it, um, you would get enough nitrogen to fertilize all of the non-dairy, non-meat food crops for everybody in Tacoma. So basically between the food scraps and what you pee and poop, you make enough fertility to grow all the vegetables and grains that you need each year. Um, now, in Vermont, you're doing pretty well considering where you are. Um, agriculture takes, uh, this is from 2018, so um, PFAS had already hit the, the screen here or hit the fan, so to speak. Um, but you can see that um, the amount of the biosolids that has been landfilled has gone up 15% from 2004 to 2018, and the amount put to beneficial reuse has gone down. I know you are very close to ground zero for PFAS, and I know the Atlantic magazine just had another article about the horrors of wastewater. I also know that it's maybe 10 farms that have been terribly impacted in Maine. And I also know that this picture was taken very much to scare the crap out of you, literally and figuratively. Um, this is a foggy March day. This is not a young, vibrant looking guy. This is not a gigantic, healthy cow. Um, I know that this is scary and this can be tough, but our planet on a larger scale can be even scarier, especially when PFAS can be found in our bodies, in our bloods, in rain, in snow, in sleet, just anyway. So um, when if if you're thinking about composting biosolids at all, this is um, a graphic from the California Association of Sanitary Agencies looking at the relative concentration, makeup, <clears throat> food packaging. If you want to reduce your PFAS exposure, the best option for you is not to stop using biosolids compost or food scrap compost. It's more to not eat at McDonald's anymore and to stop using foundation because these, in our everyday lives, these materials have orders of magnitude more PFAS than any residuals that we might make. So um, this is a carrot on compost. Um, and and anybody would be proud of this carrot. Uh, you guys are really setting a model for the nation. Um, composting works well for so many things. Uh, you get rid of that methane, you build soils, you store carbon, and it makes the world a better place. Um, to do uh, to get that extra star, that A plus um, plus, dry and grind appliances at home may be helpful. Um, marketing specific blends can also be helpful and, and to help the planet think about working a little more with wastewater. And that's what I have. And so, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Sally. I think we do have some. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, we do have some um, time for questions, um, but I will just also want to take a minute to remind folks that we do have a PFAS specific session this afternoon is one of our concurrent sessions, and it's also going to come up again later in the virtual program. So um, just so you have that reminder. And then um, we do have some time for questions. Maybe we'll start if there are any from the Zoom room and then we'll move to the room and sort of bounce back and forth. Yes, we have a few questions in the chat. One of them was just asking if you could share the link to the study about the cover crops. Um, can oh, I can send it to Kafka. Yep, if you send it to me, I can, um, along with the recording and the slide deck, I can also post links to any of the studies that Sally shared. Great. Yeah, and I can, I'm happy to send PDFs of the studies that we've done, but I have to tell you that it might be um, much more enjoyable to just read the column. 
columns than the studies. <laughs> a plug for columns over studies. Got it. Thank you. I'm just saying it's anyway. <laughs> Um, and then I have one question about the at home uh, food, quote unquote, composting um, products. Don't like say you it. Mentioned. Don't go down that yes. road. Yeah, I know. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm the trying to draw it. Dehydrators. Yes, the food de dehydrators. Um, yep. You know, a, a comment was made that they're not really um, affordable in some homes. And so, what other encouragement is there to facilitate composting in the winter? Uh, so I will say um, that uh, for so one one thing that Mill did that I and I know about this because I've worked with them some, but um, they did a pilot in Tacoma, and Tacoma is a place where you pay as you throw, and so you have the um, potential if you throw away less to get a smaller bin and pay less, and that can. Um, and in the case of Tacoma, they had the people that tried the, the mill were really happy and in fact reported that they paid less. So in a future case or in certain case, certain areas where um, you don't have regular pickups, you have uh, you have to drive your material in to be recycled or um, to a transfer station. Um, you can save on transport and you can save on tip fees. Um, worm composting is also great. I just saw that in the in the um, chat messages. Um, for other than that, uh, you know, I know home composting can be great. I also know that it's really tough in the winter and it's really tough when the stuff is smelly and um, not so nice to deal with. So for me, uh, we first got a food cycler three or four years ago and it was really transformative. And, and so I, go on. Go No, go ahead, Sally, sorry. I would think that over time in various iterations, some of these are gonna become the equivalent of dishwashers, something that you didn't know you needed and then you get one, it's like, oh my, that's easier. And it turns out dishwashers save money and save water too. Yeah, I'll just quickly add um, that we do have a section on the on-farm composting um, toolkit that have has been developing on winter composting troubleshooting specifically. So if anyone wants extra resources or alternative ways to manage composting, it can reach out to me directly. Um, so why don't we take one more question from Zoom and then we'll we'll see if there's questions in the room and then we'll go back and forth a little bit. Great. Um, so this question is about what your definition of biosolids is specifically. Yeah, it's just, it's a standard. It's um, centralized wastewater treatment. Um, the solids produced after um, the material has been treated to reduce pathogens. Typically, um, um, if you have a septic system, you get it pumped and it's discharged into a wastewater treatment plant. Typical characteristics of the biosolids are fairly consistent depending on the treatment process. The percent nitrogen is usually between four and seven percent. Percent phosphorus is between one and three percent. Great, thank you. Any questions in the room? Yep, there's one right here in front. Hi, thanks for your presentation, Sally. Um, I was just curious and really interested in that kind of 50% stalling of your diversion rates in Seattle, where you've had that law for about 15 years of mandatory diversion of organics. Um, we just saw from Emma that for the state of the state that it's kind of similar according to the updated study here in Vermont. And I was wondering um, if you have any ideas to break through that 50% or what might be causing that stall there. Um, so, um, and this is just me, so it's not scientific. I think that um, one of the issues is, is the green bin is outside your house and on the green, so I live in a multifamily. We have an apartment in Seattle and we have a green bin. And there's a, a, a picture 
cover on the green bin about what can and cannot go into your your food scrap bin. And that's really great to have that. Um, but you want that in your kitchen when you're actually doing the separation. I think there's a misunderstanding or not full understanding about what can go in these. And that leads people to put stuff in the garbage or put it down the sink as opposed to putting it in um, the green bin. Um, I think that the yuck, yuck factor still regularly plays in. I think it's a range of these things. Um, and Seattle Public Utilities does have an online guide to what you can and cannot put into green compost bins, but um, it's not nearly as informative or as interactive as other apps for other things. So I think the interface um, needs to be in the kitchen and I think it needs to be much more user-friendly. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the room? Um, hello, I've, I've got a question about the uh, methane emissions. Uh, and I mean, there's nothing good about methane emissions. The methane, they're just terrible things. But uh, Walter Yenna, who is a uh, climate scientist from Australia, has asserted that uh, uh, methane is very quickly broken down in the atmosphere uh, as long as there's water moisture and ultraviolet light present. Now, that's a very broad assertion. I don't know how, you know, how relevant it is, but I was wondering if you could characterize just how much uh, natural mitigation of methane emissions there are close to the Earth's surface and as long as there's some sun. So um, methane is a short-lived gas. It has a residence time of about 12 years is I think the average. Um, and the 23 times as um, impactful as CO2 is based on a hundred year time frame. So a lot of people have argued that rather than express it as a hundred year time frame, it needs to be uh, expressed as like a 25 year time frame where all of a sudden methane goes from instead of 23 times to about 75 times as impactful as CO2. So while the climate scientist from Australia is correct that the atmospheric resonance time is much, much shorter than other gases, um, that's reflected in the in the impact. And it's one of the deals with methane is it, it, it doesn't need um, a silver bullet um, genius uh, MacArthur rant type Albert Einstein solution. It needs you to put your food scraps in a different bin and for municipalities to have the the nerve to enforce this. So that's a solution. It's a very easy solution to get rid of a short-lived climate gas that would have a very quick impact at minimal cost. All right, one more question from the room and then we'll check back in with the Zoom questions. Any, oh, right over there on the, oh, is there one over here too? Sorry. Um, okay, we'll come back to you. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Zui. I'm from We Radiate. Uh, my question was, uh, you showed a slide about how farmers can compost and they can use that in their farms. So I was wondering if you had any insight on what are the barriers and challenges currently that are facing farmers that is stopping them from composting more or using that as a fertilizer in their farms? Um, so on-farm composting is, is one thing um, that um, I know in some states there are um, restrictions on how much on-farm composting can, can take place and how much materials farmers can accept. I When I was on the USDA committee, on urban and innovative agriculture, one of the things that our panel or committee recommended to the secretary was that um, on-form composting be promoted and restrictions be lessened. Um, one of the deals with using compost on a farm is it can be a very expensive process and you don't necessarily get the 
the nutrient bang as quickly as you would from regular fertilizers. Um, the extension infrastructure, um, which a lot of farmers turn to, has been reluctant in many cases to recommend and to teach farmers how to appropriately use composts. So um, there can be restrictions for farmers who want to compost. There can also be um, knowledge gap limitations and financial limitations for farmers to that prevent them from starting to integrate compost use into their standard practices. Thank you. And I'll just say that's an excellent promotion for Thursday morning's virtual session where we'll be talking about this exact topic in detail for a 90 minute session. Um, so hope and I didn't even us. know. Look at that. You I didn't even know. It's amazing. Right left. Right. Um, all right. We're going to take a couple more questions from the Zoom room. Shannon. Great. Um, so one of these questions um, you touched upon a little bit with regard to your own experience in multifamily housing um, with, as you mentioned, keeping, um, you know, having the visual cues of the signage, having um, the assistance with separating appropriately in the home, having municipalities enforce upon this separation. Um, is there anything else you could share quickly about increasing food waste diversion in multifamily homes? You know, if I knew that answer, I could be rich now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, Behavior change is hard, and um, I don't think it, in a in a single family home you typically have a yard and you can get it. You know you can. It it helps a lot with this stuff if you can take it and use it in your own garden and see the benefits. Um, and multifamily are typically one extra step away from that. Other, I mean. That is not necessarily the real full answer, but um, that's that's I if again if I had a real full answer, I'd be boy would I be raking in the consulting fees. <laughs> Thank you. I think you mentioned you know upon a lot of the different things that would promote um, multifamily food scrap diet diversion. Um, the next question I have is about your view on biochar because it gets a lot of hype. And if you can share some pros and cons about combining it with com compost. So biochar was seen as, um, okay, uh, <laughs> this is a really stupid analogy, but I'm far away and I can't see the audience. So I, I won't be embarrassed. <laughs> so I just got hyaluronic acid to, to stop my wrinkles. And I use my hyaluronic acid every day. Does it do anything? No. It doesn't do anything. Um, but you know, it's an easy thing and I can smear it on and I feel better. So char is, is basically being marketed as something that's going to stop my wrinkles for the soil. Um, and to me, it's a whole, it's, it's, it's more expensive and does less than my little bottle of hyaluronic acid. Um, within compost, char as a specialty ingredient for certain things, yes, there you got something. So if you integrate a little bit of char um, into your compost, there are studies that show that you can reduce ammonia volatilization. That's a great thing. There are studies that show that to some extent you can reduce odors um, because char can do that. Charcoal does that. That's a great thing. So to think of char as the universal panacea that's gonna make all soil healthy and young again, to me, that's a crock, but there are targeted specialty uses of char where it can be a very valuable ingredient. Thank you, Carrie. I saw that, I appreciate that thumbs up. Um, all I right, we're gonna I, you're go. muted, Oops. anyway. Um. Why don't we Steve have Stephen, a question from Stephen in the room? Hi, Sally, uh, Steve Wispa. Um, comment and a question. So my comment is that after, uh, it's my observation that it's not just winter that makes composting, home composting difficult, but that for most people, they're not gonna do the mixing of the browns and the greens. Um, 
They're, they're going to try and get it hot, which is basically impossible for home composting. And ultimately, it ends up being a um, uh, habitat for rat, rats. You know, I hear bears, and I saw there was someone put up a slide that showed a, a rat. I think it's one of these um, sort of dark secrets um, of home composting that doesn't really get a lot of attention. Um, so I, I really like this idea of these um, dehydration systems. Um, and yes, they can save money if you're paying to have someone haul away. You're, you're hauling up, up tremendously a lot less, and it's also not smelling. So and then so that's just one comment about that. The other, I, I, many years ago, some years ago, Will Brinton uh, published a, a study on the, I think it was called the carbon footprint of compost operations, commercial compost operations. It was put it as a question, what is your carbon footprint of your compost operation? And so my recollection is he was referring, he, he did some work looking at the uh, emissions from equipment and frequency of turning. Um, and also just less turning, maybe producing less uh, carbon emissions because there are, you know, CO2 emissions from composting. I'm just wondering if you were familiar with that or it's been updated, other people have built on that work um, and how compost operations could reduce their own emissions. Um, so, uh... There's been a number of studies on fugitive gas emissions from composting. Um, there's also been studies, and and I've done some of these on equipment emissions. Um, equipment emissions tend to be minimal in comparison. Your your real your emissions with staying power are fugitive gas because of the twenty three time multiplier factor for s methane, um, and uh, the easy, cheap way to, uh, your, your methane is mostly going to um, be an issue in a commercial facility in the first few days after you build a pile uh, when you have a higher moisture content and a higher potential for anaerobic conditions. Um, an easy thing to do is cover that initial pile with finished compost. The microbes in the finished compost will oxidize the methane before it's released. Um, so easy, and then you can just incorporate the finished material into the compost. Easy, cheap, very effective. We did um, a report for the USCC, Andrew Carpenter from Northern Tilth, who's going to be there later today. Um, and I did something on VOC, volatile organic carbon, um, or volatile organic chemical emissions from composting. And covering with finished compost does wonders. It'll do that for VOCs. It'll also do it for methane. Um, as for CO2 emissions during composting, CO2 you don't have to worry about because it's short-term carbon cycle, which means it's from the annual cycle of growth, decay, eating. Um, and so compost is only um, a potential emitter for the fossil fuels you use or energy you use during the composting process um, and also for fugitive gases. Um, so CO2 doesn't count and you can limit methane pretty easily. Great, thank you. We have time for two more questions. Maybe one from the room and one from Zoom. Anyone else in the room have a question? Yeah, right over here. Hi. Um, so you mentioned in your slide about PFAS um, food packaging. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about any recommendations in regards to commercially composable packaging plain paper food packaging, plastic packaging, or anything that you can recommend in that whole circus of packaging that is available. Thank you. So before you go, Sally, I'm just going to say that is a huge question. Um, and Sally, I'm certainly going to let you answer it, but, um, but briefly maybe. And I'll just let you know that we do have a compostable packaging session later in the week. We also have two more conversations about PFAS specifically, so we can get into more of the details at a later time in the program. But Sally, go ahead. Yet again, plugging you more sessions coming up. Look at I that. know, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. What a program. So I will say that I just submitted to Nora a 
two column and then uh, another study that was presented um, by uh, Tim O'Neill from um, ECS. Uh, so there'll be stuff in BioCycle very soon about the whole issue of compostable plastics and how well or well, not well, they, they do fare in a pile and the challenges associated with them. Um, uh, a number of states, Washington being one of them, are limiting how much PFAS can be used in food packaging. Um, and their limits are something like 100 parts per million, which if you think about it, it is 100,000 parts per billion. And if you think about the drinking water limits as parts per trillion, that's another three zeros. So food you packaging use of PFAS is still a huge issue. And so cook at home. And instead of using saran wrap, use a plate to cover the leftovers. There you have it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And these are big topics. I don't mean to push them aside, but it really takes more time than we have. Um, right. All right, so one more question from Zoom, and then I think we'll wrap the session. Yeah, the final question that we have on Zoom, I believe you saw it uh, a few minutes ago, is about uh, different amendments in compost and the value of them. Specifically, the question was about seaweed amendments. Um, so do you have anything to share about the use of amendments in compost or soil? Um, so seaweed, I don't think it's, I mean, I, some a woman at where I work is doing a test about um, seaweed is an amendment. Um, I, I got to tell you, it's going to have a fair amount of sodium in it. Sodium isn't good for plants. Um, and I can seaweed salad can be delicious. But until we get all of the food waste and food scraps and other easily land-based compostable materials into piles, I, I don't see a special need for seaweed. Sorry to, <laughs> and I love swimming and I love the ocean. So this is not, uh, <laughs> especially but nothing, Vermont nothing does personal. not have a lot of coastal property. There's not a lot of coastal <laughs> property in Vermont. I would not go out of your way to get seaweed. All right. Well, everybody help, help me. me. Thanks, Thanks Sally Brown. Brown. Thank I, I, I trust okay. that you're, you're saying thank you and very polite and much appreciated. And yes. I can't hear it. And, um, oh. It's okay. Have a wonderful rest of the conference. All right. Thank you so much, Sally. And thank okay. you as well to all of our Zoom participants. This actually concludes our hybrid portion of the program for today. So folks in the room, hang on. I have a couple housekeeping before we move on. But thanks to everybody. Um, a recording of this as well as the slide decks will be, um, will be provided in the next couple of weeks however soon I get to them and get them posted. So bear with me there, but we'll also have and be sure to have links to um, a lot of those sessions, a lot of the slide decks and the resources that were shared. So thank you very much for that.